Yeah, I think that's a good um, a good segue, uh, maybe into from the sanitizers um, into the work that you've been doing with Fizzcaller. Uh, do you want to talk about that for a moment? Oh yeah, that's so. That's another. I, I guess yeah, CI related topic. So Syscaller is a, is a system call fuzzer uh, developed by uh, Dmitry Bukov at uh, Google, um, and so it basically generates random programs that uh, invoke system calls and runs them, collects coverage information from the kernel, and basically continues doing that in a loop until it finds something that crashes the kernel. Um, so it's found thousands and thousands of bugs across basically all major operating systems. Um, you know, it supports all of the all of the BSDs. Um, uh, Linux, of course, I think uh, some folks are using it to fuzz Darwin and, um, you know, other, other OS like projects like GVisor. Um, so it's been enormously successful and, and uh, Google's been uh, kind enough to, to run a public instance that continually fuzzes FreeBSD and Linux and, and other operating systems uh, and, and generates email when it finds a bug. Um, so that, that's been enormously useful. We've been able to catch quite a few bugs um, in short order. As a result of that, uh, so I, I've done some work to make sure that Syscaller is um, kind of reaching as much of the kernel as possible. In the sense that, you know, it, it knows about all of our system calls. It has ways to generate code, which which uh, exercises rarely rarely executed code paths where bugs tend to lurk, especially security related ones. Um, so that's found hundreds of bugs in FreeBSD. Those also get fixed pretty quickly. Um, Syscaller is quite good in that it generates reproducers for most of the bugs that it finds, so you can debug them rather easily. Um, and in the past year, we also ported several kernel, kernel sanitizers from uh, NetBSD, um, in particular the address sanitizer, memory sanitizer, and those those complement Syscaller quite well, uh, just because they they tend to catch bugs um, a bit more easily than than they would otherwise. So, whereas before you might have a double free that leads to some memory corruption. That eventually triggers your kernel panic with sanitizers and able to catch that much earlier. And so the debug needs to simplify. Um, but I think as far as stability goes in general, FreeBSD has really uh, improved a lot in the past uh, year or two as a result of this work. It could be worth mentioning here that uh, we have a sponsorship uh, with the RISC V uh, community, uh, RISC V International. Uh, to support uh, Syscaller on FreeBSD Risk Five, so there's there's been interest around this kind of newish architecture of Risk Five, and uh, fingers crossed we'll have uh, support for Syscaller after this sponsorship. So maybe mid 2022. Yeah, that that would be really great. Right now, um, uh, Syscaller supports fuzzing the AMD 64 architecture as well as um, our 32-bit compatibility layer there. So other platforms like uh, RISC-V and, and ARM64 currently aren't fuzzed, but that would obviously be very desirable for us. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that project uh, make some progress. I can't say too much about the details, but I'm uh, interested in the boot time improvements that Colin Percival has been working on. I know he's been doing uh, iterative changes there very carefully as, you know, uh, it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, with having a reliable boot and, and a fast boot sometimes, but uh, I know Colin's been very careful to add minor changes here and there, and uh, I'm looking forward to those making it into a stable release. Yeah, that's a, um, a great point. Colin has been working on um, uh, finding sources of uh, uh, delays in our boot process and sort of iteratively um, removing them. So it's. You know, 100 milliseconds saved here, 500 milliseconds saved there, um, and pretty soon it starts adding up to real time. Uh, but it uh, it's it's largely um, either you know delays uh, delays in the boot process while waiting for hardware probes um, or things that were not parallelized or um, uh, sort of time uh, time calibration delays that were much longer than. Um, they needed to be all kinds of um, all kinds of, of issues scattered across a variety of subsystems. Uh, I think the uh, I'm not sure what the net net result is, but it, it's been a huge savings in the um, uh, the boot time from the kernel starting um, through to uh, the user land starting up. 
uh, I think it's it, it's it's many many seconds that have been been saved off, uh, and I think we're we're less than half of the the time that we started. I don't know if Mark, if you have the. It's it's certainly very noticeable, um, especially when you do things like developing a VM and you're frequently rebooting it um, to test kernel changes. It it really adds up, um, and it's I mean, it's just satisfying to you know boot up my laptop and, and have everything kind of fly by when I know a few years ago it was significantly slower. It fits in well with uh, the foundation's technology roadmap that includes uh, improvements to the laptop desktop experience. So uh, when you're you know at a conference with your laptop and you're rebooting frequently, it's nice to save a few seconds. Yeah, so Colin is, um, is doing that work under a Patreon that he's, uh, I'm collecting sponsorships for. I'm just looking at the stats on the wiki page at the moment, and I see. Um, so he, he, Colin started um, by analyzing 11.1 11 uh, release, which was uh, 28,208 milliseconds. Um, so 28 seconds, and then um, 14 current at the time that he tested it um, was 9,401. So about nine and a half seconds. So that's a, a huge uh, reduction in in boot time. I think that's also motivated others to to look at related problems. I mean, um, I saw that Alexander Moten recently committed some changes to improve shutdown times. We were spending a, a whole bunch of time kind of uselessly waiting for threads to park before shutting down and to fix that, um, which is also a pretty big improvement as long as you're actually shutting down your machine properly. Um, so, yeah, there's, and there's a lot of nice improvements. And there's probably um, lots of uh, work to come on user land boot time uh, improvements uh, next as uh, the next step. Right. So the, the nice thing about Colin's work is that he also has this framework for for actually measuring this thing. So you don't have to, you know, take a single machine and and uh, instrument it carefully and then and try to optimize that. You can uh, use this generalized tracing framework to to get a flame graph. That shows you know where each individual system is, is spending time and, and can optimize accordingly. Um, so some, you know, newer systems were tending to waste a lot of time calibrating using the uh, the Intel 8254 programmable intro or uh, interval timer, and uh, you know that that's the sort of thing that might show up as as a hotspot on on some systems but not others. So you know being able to uh, explore boot times on your own machine. And compare them with with others is uh, is really handy. Let's talk about uh, a big one here. Um, let's talk about ARM sixty four becoming tier one. So that is a uh, a big item. Um, the FreeBSD project first started um, with ARM sixty four many many years ago when Andy Turner um, started exploring it, uh, exploring the architecture uh, just as a member of the FreeBSD community. Um, and then the FreeBSD Foundation stepped in, stepped in to help uh, uh, by sponsoring his work and collaborating with um, ARM and uh, Cavium at the time to help sort of improve the, the state of the ARM64 port. Um, and that's progressed to the point where the, the core team agreed um, last year to promote ARM64 to tier one. So at this point, the 64-bit x86 and ARM architectures are the tier one architectures in FreeBSD, uh, which means that they're the architectures for which we provide security updates and make sure that binary packages are, are available and release images are available and, and sort of um, uh, that the security team will support and, um, and provide us a, a quality, um, uh, quality release. So, uh, I think it's it's been a long time um, coming, and I think as ARM64 really sort of increases in interest and viability, um, you know, we've seen ARM64 becoming increasingly prevalent in uh, data center use in in cloud environments, um, and so it's it's really important that FreeBSD is is available and and just works um, in those environments. Um, there's still still a bit of a gap, I think, for ARM64 sort of developer workstation desktop type environments. Um, they're, they're a little bit more limited, um, but there's definitely interest in the community uh, in supporting those. So um, although the support is, is not fully fleshed out at this point, um, 
things like Raspberry Pi 4 uh, work with FreeBSD, and, and you know, I think there's definitely an interest in, in continuing, um, continuing to improve on Raspberry Pi and, and on uh, platforms like the Pine 64 or, um, or other ARM64 embedded boards. Um, but as far as the architecture itself is concerned, uh, FreeBSD ARM64 is, is tier one and packages and uh, security updates and everything just work. Anything else to add on those? Um, nothing really. I mean, it's it's just very nice to be able to use Graviton uh, too. I, I use that quite a lot whenever I want to spin up uh, cloud instances because they, they run FreeBSD very quickly. Um, we've done some work to we've done some performance work on the ARM64 port as a result of benchmarking on, on that platform. And just having that available very easily is, is definitely a great thing. What about um, what's going on with OpenZFS and the changes there? Uh, so in 13.0, we switched um, our ZFS upstream, or I guess I should say ZFS, um, from Illumos to uh, to OpenZFS, which is or which was formerly the uh, ZFS on Linux project, um, but now supports both Linux and and FreeBSD. Um, so ZFS on Linux had quite a few improvements um, that were that were lacking in FreeBSD. Um, I can't really speak to the to the particulars of that because um, I'm, I'm not much of a ZFS power user. I, I, my experience with it is is fairly basic, um, but it definitely enabled a. a you know, a lot of a lot of workflows on FreeBSD that weren't possible before, um, and OpenZFS also just at this point is is a much more active upstream for us. Uh, you know, there's a lot of contributors from different companies and, and lots of individuals who are submitting, you know, bug fixes, cleanups, performance enhancements. Um, if you look at their their GitHub page, it's it's quite active. Um, I've been able to submit patches myself and and get timely reviews and, and merges, which is uh, which is of course very nice. Um, so it's been a really pleasant upstream to interact with, um, as as far as you know, being a FreeBSD developer goes. Um, so uh, I, I think that's that's gone quite well. Yeah, I think one way to, to look at it sort of is in in the past, uh, Illumos was the upstream for the project, and we were a downstream consumer and sort of maintain our own port of it. Whereas with OpenZFS, uh, in in effect. It's not really necessarily an upstream uh, for us in the same way. It's it's that both Linux and FreeBSD now use this shared common uh, code base that we collaborate on. And, and OpenZFS basically just instead of being the upstream, it it is the ZFS that's in FreeBSD and in Linux. Yeah. 